trusting your spirit to work and weave among us. May each of us hear the particular call to follow that you have for us this morning. May our hearts and our minds and our lives be open to receive your word, to hear it deeply, and to have the courage and the willingness to live it out. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So some of you know that um, our daughter, Sophie, um, has been in a university where for the first time now, in her senior year, her final semester, she'll actually be in the United States. She has spent the previous three and a half years on different continents in different countries. It was interesting in speaking with her that New York City has been the hardest adjustment. It wasn't Costa Rica and learning Spanish. It wasn't China with a big, a small town for China but still had 10 million people. It wasn't Australia or New Zealand where she was in a completely different continent and time zone. New York City. Maybe it's because the expectation was that now she's in the country in which she was raised. They speak the language which is the language with which she was also raised. But those expectations have been pretty challenging as she tries to navigate now this semester. It made me think about how Jesus calls each one of us exactly where we are, with exactly what we've got. Her challenge now will be to let go of what she thought it might be, could be, was supposed to be, and be in what is. So where are you today? How is God calling you to follow in your particular circumstance, in your particular situation, with all the particularities of your life in this time and place? That's what I want to invite you into this morning. I think there are many different callings we have over the course of our lifetimes. As Lutherans, we talk a lot about vocation, a calling. We talk about marriage being a vocation, parenting being a vocation. Those things change though, and they have different stages and seasons to them. The work you do may be your calling. I love Frederick Buechner's um, definition of vocation. He writes, vocation is the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Sophie in her senior year is also trying to understand what the future is calling her to, where she'll use the education she's now just about to complete and what she's learned about herself. We know those kind of milestone times like graduation from high school or, or college or your first job. And in it, in every step and every part, God is calling us and inviting us to follow Jesus. A call just isn't for religious professionals. It's for all of us. I was struck this week in the calling of James and John. How they were called right where they are to do what they've been doing with just a little bit of a twist. They were fishermen. Now, we've talked before, at least in Bible study and maybe in sermons too, the fishing industry was becoming just that in the day and age of Jesus. So the context has some nuance to it. See, fishing had been a family matter. People often wonder in hearing this morning's text, what about Zebedee? He was left there in the boat alone. His kids just took up and followed Jesus. But the fishing at that time of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee had become very political. Herod decided that this would be a great industry in the day and age of Jesus. So fishing was becoming commercialized. Small family fishing units were being moved out. This is some of what you hear when there's complaints about taxes. Fishing was being taxed. It's a great way to end a family business. 
make it absolutely <coughs> unaffordable for them to continue. And it's into this time of trial and challenge, the very things that they raised and probably had relatives from generations do, he calls them out from this. But I have a sense he's still gonna use those same gifts, the gifts they had as fishermen, patience. Looking to the seas to understand when to put down the nets and when not. Living life on life's terms. Sometimes the catch will be great. And sometimes you'll put out those nets and they'll be, our, be nothing. Yesterday I spent six hours at a retreat. It was a great time of refreshment for me to listen about boundless compassion. The speaker shared that this actually is a calling for all of us as followers of Jesus. Compassion is to suffer with. <coughs> to suffer with. There's a tendency in our culture to kind of spit shine suffering. It'll be over. Get over it. It'll be done. But as followers, this is one place that we absolutely trust that God meets us in our deep brokenness, in our despair, in the darkness. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We hear both in Isaiah and in the gospel. And maybe it's you. Maybe it's you in particular in this time and this place that is being called to be that light. Now this isn't to shine a light and blind someone who's in a difficult and painful place. But we suffer with them. This doesn't mean we take on their suffering. That's Christ's to do. But we become the hands and the hearts and the body and the love of Christ. And we grow in our capacity to sit with others in times that are dark. This is Christian spiritual formation. We need one another. That's part of what we learned with those little maze games, that if someone was even just sitting beside someone else and maybe giving them a few cues, but not doing it for them, so we don't take over someone else's suffering. But we learn to be unafraid. <clears throat> unafraid of the darkness. Unafraid of the pain. Because we have our own experiences of living through it and allowing others to walk alongside us, to be with us in it. Richard Rohr quotes St. Francis of Assisi talking about the two journeys of great joy and deep suffering. God meets us in both of those places, and that's where we become formed. Last night, one of the little girls who was here for the children's message was wearing her sparkly shoes. She's only two, so the question was a little bit challenging for her about what brings her great joy. But I saw her kick up those little sparkly shoes, and I knew that maybe that was part of it. It's one of the gifts of children. They often can fully embrace joy. And then they fall, something happens. They're very sad, but they bounce back often. We learn to be with young people who are in their joy and they invite us into that very moment where we're just present in that moment. And we learn compassion, how to be with them in their suffering. I think about how many people just in the past several years have been on that journey with a beloved pet, who they knew that the time had come for this pet's life to end, and they were with them. Pets are often great companions who actually often will mirror our great joy and also our deep suffering. I've been trying to make sure that I don't just read professional works or nonfiction. And so I just read an interesting and entertaining but disturbing and challenging book. Maybe some of you have read it. 
Its title is Eleanor Oliphant is Perfectly Fine. It's actually a story about deep loneliness. And I probably don't have to tell you that now, do I? We live in such a lonely time. Incredibly lonely. Eleanor would go home from work on Friday and not speak a word, not to anyone, until Monday. It's a story about the challenges of allowing ourselves to know one another and be known. It's a challenge about both sharing great joy and allowing others into our deep suffering. Sometimes I'll do the counting of things, and yesterday when I had my regular Saturday morning phone call with my roommate from college, I was trying to do the counting of how many decades it's been now that we've been friends. Of course, I went to college, as many of you did, if you went to college with many people. We had many joyous occasions, but those friendships didn't always last. But the ones who had compassion, who suffered with me, those are the people often still in my life. Jesus called Simon and Andrew, James and John. He called people to follow in pairs. I think it gives us some of the instruction that we need in this journey of following Jesus. We need one another. So that maybe if I am in that time of deep despair, you're not going to sit beside me and flash your joy at me to kind of cheer me up. But I'll know that you too trust God and can sit beside me in that darkness, being that presence of God. Loneliness, isolation, feeling like there is no way out. That's part of what this book shared. And so it was little drips. It was a little way that someone at work became friends with her. And he had the willingness to keep showing up. I think that's a lot of discipleship, is the willingness to show up. That's why I want to encourage you to consider, maybe there is someone, and their, their name comes to mind for you. They're on your heart. Could you give them a phone call? Not to send a text message, but maybe that's your first entree. Show up at their door. Ooh, that'd be breaking a lot of rules in our culture. But they could probably see you ahead of time on their ring doorbell. <laughs> Decide whether or not to hide from you. You know, that's what I'm always wondering, you know. And they're hearing what I'm saying. But let's not be afraid. Let's trust that these examples of discipleship are not just examples for someday, another day, but the here, now day. And reflect upon what is your deep joy. And how might God use that to meet and connect with the deep sorrow and the suffering in our world. Yesterday at this retreat, which was entitled Boundless Compassion, we were reminded again that it's a setup. It's a setup right now where we are so overwhelmed by so much information where after a while you just turn off the news and you shut down Facebook and you just want to hide behind your ring doorbell. But the call isn't to solve everything out here. It's to love the one right in front of you. And maybe Jesus actually met your real next door neighbor when he said love your neighbor as yourself. But we were reminded also that we have to let it begin with ourselves. To let in that love. To let in that compassion. To trust God to keep working in us, and around us, and through us. And then just in little baby steps, moments, interactions that are small out of time. Who knows if you might not be that person who actually invites the voice and speaks to someone who otherwise might not have any contact between Friday when work is over and Monday when work begins. 
God is calling. He's calling you in particular with what you've got, who you are, as you are, and inviting you to both allow yourself to be the recipient, too, of someone's companionship and walking alongside you, and then to share that love in the flesh. Amen. Amen.